this section is uh, as follows. So you're going to have three sessions, is three sessions in total. So the, the duration of the workshop is three hours, 30 minutes. And uh, we are going to cover relational database management system uh, uh, as our session one within one hour, 45 minutes. And we'll dive into Red Cup uh, for about one hour. And we'll spend some time discussing the API security and how you can protect your database credentials whenever you are collaborating. So with regards to objective and scope of the workshop today, so I hate to disappoint that uh, we are not going to write much of SQL code today. Uh, uh, so my assumption is that uh, you at least have a familiarity using R, uh, basic write, writing a basic code, creating objects, I mean, working with vectors. And we want to extend that to uh, showing you how you can connect your R Studio to a relational database management system somewhere that stores your data and use the same code that you write on a daily basis to be able to interact with it, uh, extract data, manipulate, and efficiently do your analysis. So that being said, uh, we are just going to focus on connecting R to databases. And we have two choices of database in the workshop today. So that will be uh, relational database management. In this case, I only managed to have my SQL set up, but the techniques uh, provided are standard to even SQL uh, databases hosted in SQL Server. And uh, of course, RedCup, which is a web-based uh, secure, uh, also relational database management system. So once we establish that to that end, we'll be able to now look at how to extract or rather, once you establish a connection, how can you extract data and what are the best practices? And finally, because we are talking about APIs and backend packages, so meaning you are going to provide the R studio with some credentials, so we'll talk about managing API security. So how can you be safe while you are connecting your data set, data, database to R? If time allows, I'm planning to do to give extra a few a few extras to them. So uh, just an overview of SQLite databases, like the light light the light version of uh, server the server based databases. So it's a serverless database, very portable. I use it mostly with shiny application. And uh, yeah, so I just hope we get a few minutes at the end of the workshop to be able to cover that. And obviously the, 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 the epitome of uh, why you want to connect your database to R is to basically automate a process. So you want to automate an extraction, you want to automate a processing, you want to automate a reporting. And yeah, so it, it, it's, it's been implemented. Uh, uh, and uh, if we get time, we can, uh, look at how you can achieve this, or rather, maybe give you pointers. If you don't find, if if you don't get time, I'll give you pointers to where you can be able to uh, uh, achieve uh, this automation. Okay, so to start off, a quick poll. I uh, just want you to reply with a one for yes and zero for no. If you've ever worked with a relational database management or rather a relational database before, uh, and if that's the case, which one? So. Just quickly, uh, 30 seconds. So one for yes, you have worked with the databases before, relational databases before, and zero if you have not. So if you have, we'll appreciate if you let us know uh, 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 which one. Okay, John, what do we have? Uh, I think more than 80% of the experience with the databases. That's fantastic. Uh, that's good. So that means uh, the, the delivery will be a bit quick and uh, easy. So I'll jump into it. So, so this session one will focus on relational data, database management system. And um, we'll, uh, I'll do, as already I've done five minutes, so I'll do a slide demo of how you can connect to database. And uh, uh, I'll do a live coding of the same. Then I'll give you a few minutes to try out an exercise. And uh, so if you have already cloned this project, 
I'm not sure whether everyone has been able to, to, to have uh, their instance of the cloud, but it's good. Just go to head, head to the exercise folder. They are clearly named. So we'll try out exercise one. So the, 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 the idea is not to finish the exercise because there are solutions in the backup folder. You can always refer, but I just want to attempt. So, so that's how we are going to spend uh, one hour, the one hour for five minutes uh, of the, sorry, the, the, the first time. Uh, about for five minutes of the of session one. Okay, so um, a little bit about introduction uh, uh, to the relational management system. So uh, this is a widely used um, uh, approach to managing data or other storing data. So uh, most organizations, research institutes, business uh, premises, uh, large business premises, they use relational database management systems to, to store their data. And in a relational database, for those who have familiar, who has a familiarity with the relational database, that you have the data in tables which are related uh, uh, via columns we call primary keys, so that you are able to basically uh, join one table to another to get uh, uh, maybe a full picture of your entire data set. So, and uh, most, I'm saying most because there are other uh, uh, variants of uh, the SQL. So the most most of the relational database, database management systems use the standard SQL language, which is the structured query language, to actually query and manage the data in those particular databases. And the most popular of these systems are the listed. And uh, like I said, we are going to focus on the first one, MySQL. And uh, if we get time, we look at SQL. So we have other uh, commercial versions uh, like Oracle uh, and and the, and the family. We are not going to touch on those and we just focus on MySQL for today. So the in connecting uh, database, there are two ways you can connect to a database. And um, we are going to, going to uh, go through the two, the two standard ways and uh, uh, see how that works in practice. So the first way, the first approach you can connect to a database is this using a standard uh, ODBC driver. So ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity. And usually this uh, is, I will say, is the standard because uh, you can connect uh, to commercial databases and as well as open, 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 open source databases using this approach, just that you make sure you have a driver installed. So just going through the code that you are seeing here is, um, so the DB connect, is actually a function from the DBI package, which is the underlying uh, 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 player in this uh, business of uh, interacting, uh, making making our interactive databases. So uh, you specify a few fundamental uh, parameters here. So you specify, specify the driver based on the system you're using. You're going to see that in practice. You specify the driver, you specify the server. This server is the, the, the address or the host where the database is. It can be an IP address, it can be uh, a server address uh, like uh, URL or something. Then database is the name of the database that you want to connect to. And obviously then you provide the, the, the credential, the user, the user identification and the password. So this object here is the name. So it can be anything, you can name it anything. So you can name uh, the, your connection. Maybe you are having several databases. You can create several connections. Uh, and have them give uh, have unique names so that you can work with them uh, in in parallel. Uh, the second approach is using what you call the database interface uh, compliant uh, backend package. So this is usually for connecting to open source databases such as my uh, MySQL, SQLite, and uh, and the rest and the family. So the DBI package is, as I said, is the main bridge. So the DBI package offers actually the interface for connecting R to, 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 to a database. So, so what it does is that um, either by using a backend package, which is uh, specific to the database that you're connecting to, or by using an ODBC driver, which I've just talked about here. So again, uh, looking at the syntax of this connectivity is that you have the connection name, which you, you, you specify the name of how you want to name your connection, which contains the instruction on how R Studio will connect with your with your database and obviously the backend package. So for our MySQL, the backend package is MySQL. Uh, for our SQLite, uh, sorry, for the for our, for MySQL, 
the pack, the back end packages are MySQL for SQLite. The back the package the back uh, back end packages are, are SQLite and and so forth. So again, uh, you see there's a slight difference, but uh, the, 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 the idea is the same. Provide the host, provide the database name, and give the username and password, and the, connect, the connection will be established. So that in the picture looks like this. So uh, the first picture here is uh, uh, what I've talked about, the open source databases. So R provides a way through the DBI package to directly connect to an open source database such as R MySQL. Um, um, I don't know whether open source is the right word, but I say open directly connect to an open database like uh, R MySQL. I don't think it's open source uh, uh, as per se. So, so what uh, what DBI uh, offers is a, a bridge with a, a bit of instruction uh, added on with this uh, using these packages to be able to establish a SQL, a SQL engine to connect to your database and be able to extract and interact with the data from within your R studio. Uh, so for the uh, commercial databases, the DBI package as well offers, uh, 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 the ODBC package offers um, uh, the drivers that enables you to connect to your commercial database. And again, DBI package, uh, DBI for database interface, is the center of all this. So we are going to see how this plays in practice and how you can um, uh, uh, actually connect your uh, R Studio to uh, your database. So I'm going to switch to R. And uh, do some little bit of coding. So the first uh, demo is just to show you how you can uh, Connect to database. I'm going to decrease this font. I hope everyone is able to see. So, uh, so I'm going to load the necessary packages required. So some of them I'll need them later on, but I want you to take note of this package here, which is the ODBC package that offers the ODBC drivers, and uh, our MySQL, which is the backend package for MySQL database, and obviously the DBI package, which is the main interface. So first of all. Uh, we want to create a connection using the first system, uh, uh, like the first approach for ODBC driver. So there's a function from within DBI, which is DBC, DB, ODBC list drivers, whereby you can be able to uh, uh, list the drivers available. Uh, uh, Hello, Chris. Sorry yes? for interruption. Uh, someone is requesting you increase the font. Sorry? OK. Yeah. Is that fine? That's better, thank you. Okay, so uh, I need to hide, I need to hide. Uh, okay, I think that's okay. Thank you. So, um, so I'm going to list uh, a couple of drivers available from here. So, um, and because I'm going to connect to, um, my SQL uh, database, so I'll pick my SQL. So you can see there are so many drivers available. So this might be different from your end because maybe you might be using your local machine. So, and if your local machine does not have any uh, compatible drivers, you can install those drivers from this link. So I can just put it on the chart so that uh, whoever is working from, um, uh, so you can just go there, select your, your, your system and download the, 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 the ODBC uh, driver so and install. Okay, so to save time, I'm going to copy uh, the code from here and just uh, probably, uh, I'm just going to copy it and feed in uh, the, initial, the, initial, the necessary credentials. So, uh, uh, okay, so, Put it there. So then um, the DB Connect is to establish the connection. So I'm just going to name this my, my DB Connect connection or something like that. So, and uh, just to mention that uh, whoever wants to walk along with the, the, the code, if you go to the folder R, you'll find there's a script uh, named walkthrough script. So it, ha it has all this code. So you can go ahead and uh, copy and follow along with me, but I just want to run it with you here, but just know that you can find them. You can find the, all the scripts and I'm going to write 
in the session can be found here. And the database information can also be found in the in the in the in the exercises. If you got the exercises, then open either the R Markdown or the HTML. Uh, I'll open the HTML because I'm working with the R Studio. So you'll find all the credentials necessary to connect to your database. So in this case, I'm going to con pick up, say, um, uh, the submit. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to use this. I'm going to pick this database uh, named uh, NHS R Conference. So this is a database name. This is the host. This is where it's hosted in Amazon Web Service. Uh, uh, then we have the user is the password and user is the user is the ID and user is the password. So I'm going to copy this, which is my address, sub address, and paste it um, here, like that. Then the database name, uh, as you've seen, it's NHS conference. There are many there. Uh, you can pick one, but I'm going to for, for this demo, I'm going to use this one. Then the user ID is just user and the password is user. So I need to specify my driver. So I've used the ODBC list driver function to be able to, to list the drivers available. So I'm going to pick uh, the appropriate one, which is my SQL, because I'm connecting to my SQL database. Then I'm going to run this command like that. Uh, I think uh, something uh, went wrong somewhere. I... You have a typo on the password. The password. Oh yeah. Thank you, John. Fantastic. So, yep. So now I have a connection, and you can see it. Can, it pops up on the connection uh, uh, tab on the on the on the on the on our studio. And uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of connecting using ODBC driver or uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, SQL uh, any uh, DBI DBI compliant compliant backend. So, so now I have a connection to my database like that. So I can go ahead and. Uh, uh, maybe exploit, but before I explore that, I want to also show you how you can do the same for the second implementation, which is using the DBI compliant package. So I'm going to copy this package, this function, uh, this syntax here, and take it to my uh, to my to my R Studio. Then I'm going to just name this my DB connection, maybe option two, like that. Then I'm going to supply it with the necessary. So of course, the host is the same, is the address. Is the same uh, this one here. So this can be an IP address, can be anything, so long as it points to where your database is hosted. So I provided there as a, as a, as a, as a uh, like a string. Then the database name is NHS um, R conference. I don't want to do a, a, a typo again. And the user is user, and the password is user. So. If I run this, I get um, an object in my environment here, which are both connections, as you can see. So uh, I can go ahead and now explore this database, this connection. So I can I can maybe even say what's the class. I just want to check the class of my first connection. How does it look like? You can see it's a MySQL package, and it's uh, in, uh, in the global environment. I can also check the class of my other second option. Uh, my DB, so option two, does it look, what does it look like? So it's a, a, a MySQL connection. So you can just look at the difference. So then I can now be able to list the tables in the database using the connection. So, so that is made possible using the function named DB. So there's DB list tables. So DB list tables takes two arguments. Uh, the first argument is uh, the connection. So it takes the connection. So I can use either of the connections. So I can let me use the first connection, my DB, my DB connection like that. Then the second of the second argument, it takes. Uh, sorry, I think it takes uh, one. So one 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 argument, which is the DB connection. So you give DB list tables. You give it a connection. It will list. It will give you back the number of tables in that particular database like that. So let me try that using the second uh, connection, DB list tables. Uh, then I. Provide you the connection, which is my DB uh, option two, like that. So you see, either way, how you connect it doesn't matter. It will still give you the same information. And uh, it says that the database has three tables. 
that is the baseline table, clinical table, and lab table. Then you can go ahead and uh, be curious more and just check how many, how many, how many fields or how, how many variables are in each of the specific tables. So I can maybe pick randomly on the clinical table. I want to check how many how many variables are in the clinical table or baseline table. So that is made possible with a function called DB list fields, like that. So the DB list field takes two arguments, as you can see. The first argument is the connection of the database. So I'll give it my DB connection. Then the second argument is the name of the table from the database. So in this case, I want I'm interested to look at the DB, sorry, the table uh, clinical. So if you run that command, you get that, okay, so my table, my clinical table has six variables, subject ID, deep breed, parlor, temperature, fever, and the fever duration. And if you do the same with the option two, you'll find this, you get the same information, and that's the idea. Like, uh, whichever the whichever way you connect, it, you should always query the same, uh, uh, the same information. So uh, I want to stop there with the demo of connecting to the database, and uh, switch back to my slides and allow you to uh, attempt the first exercise. You don't have to finish it. And uh, so it will take like 10 minutes and we have like in between, we can combine that with a, a five minute break, then we'll come back and see how we can be able to now extract data from the connection that we have established. Uh, is, that, is that agreeable? Sorry, Chris, I think we are. Can you take one question? Yeah, sure. Luis. Yeah, Luis asks whether if you share your code with the uh, password and uh, those credentials, login credentials, how can you go about it not sharing the, the direct information? So that's that's session three. So if you look at uh, if you look at my plan uh, here, uh, that's session three, managing API security. So that will come at the end of. Uh, the, 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 that's, that will be my last, the last thing I'll cover because I know obviously this is very controversial because I have everything here. I have the database name, I have the password and I have the, sorry, I have the username and I have the password and I have the, 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 the address. So obviously if this information falls into the wrong hands, that's, that's, that's pretty much for uh, bad, bad news for any, for any organization or company. So that's what I'm going to cover at the end on how you can be safe using this implementation, collaborate, but at the same time, nobody gets to know your credentials. Sorry, I got ahead of myself, thanks. No problem, thank you. I, I'm, I'm happy because now it's, uh, it seems like uh, there's excitement to use this and uh, be safe while using it. <laughs> okay, so will we attempt exercise one and uh, John or uh, Chandan, you can, Track that down, the timing, and uh, just 10 minutes. And uh, we can have a short break. Then should we come back uh, at what time, John? Uh, uh, quarter to the top of the hour. OK, fantastic. So are we, uh, are we doing 15 minutes? So we are doing 10 minutes exercise. And uh, there's, uh, I'm, I'm combining that with the break. Where, so if you get okay. the exercise done, you can take a break. So. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, just attempt, there are solutions to the exercises, but attempt first before looking at the solution. So if you go to the exercises, there's exercise one. If you go to this folder backup, there's the solution code there. All I'm saying is that try to attempt before looking at the solution. That's, that's the way you, that's, the, that's uh, like, I mean, uh, the approach that enable you learn something, so yeah. So, and uh, you now have to finish it if you don't, Manage to finish the exercises, and that's the reason why I have the solutions there. So, so let's let's uh, let's meet back in fifteen minutes. If you, if you finish the exercise, you can just uh, drop a message on the chat that you are done, so that at least we can can see what's going on. So just you can say, and if you are stuck, 
if you don't want to look at the solution yet, you can grab John or Chandan or, or I, and uh, we can be able to help you out.
Um, Christopher, do you want to um, walk Louise through just to how to run the basic scripts? Sorry? Do you want to, uh, Louise is, um, needs a bit of help with the running the scripts. Sorry, um, I've, never just the chat. I've never interacted with it like this before, so I'm a bit lost, but I don't mind. I'll catch up. I'm just so, a bit behind. So, sorry, so what, so what I want, uh, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I ideally should do if you open the exercise, I've already loaded the packages, uh, so you can just run, load the packages, then uh, try connecting uh, uh, to the database named uh, NYC Flies 13. So you can get all the information about the databases in this uh, file, database info HTML. So there's the database name, there's the, 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 the way it's hosted, and the username and password. So ideally, you can name the connection uh, whatever you want, uh, but I just want to you to have success uh, connecting. So, but I suggested a few names to use here, which is which is All okay. All right. So, sorry. I think it's a. I need a step back. Actually, sorry. <laughs> I feel a bit stupid, but anyway. Um, how did I don't understand how to make it so that the working directory is this cloud project exercises thing? So, if you click, so if you are, if you already have your 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 project set up, so if you click, I think on this. This big R, like hexagon up there, you should see this number of folders in 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 your in your end. Is it the case? Chris, I don't know whether she has she has set up the project by pulling. I think it I just mustn't have set up set up properly or something. Just don't worry, I'll just figure it out. So I think what you can do, uh, I'll, I'll ask a question. If there's anyone having a problem setting up the the, the, the project, because it's uh, it's pretty much simple. I I I'm, I'm I'm supported by two of my colleagues. We I'm sorry we didn't do proper introduction, uh, but uh, they can always help in the breakout room to just get you started so that you can be able to 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 to, to walk through with this. Uh, alternatively. Uh, if you have the, the GitHub link, so there's this script for package installation, uh, which you can do on your local uh, uh, machine. So it can install all the packages that are necessary. But I am not advising that because I mean some it can be it can take even more of your time because uh, based on which machine you are using. Uh, uh, this, uh, it, it, some might like, you know, installation. Sometimes there's that problem is compilation. You don't have R tools and all those stuff. So that's why you wanted to use the cloud to avoid all that. There's a question that was posted here that uh, you need to install the or the, the drivers in your machine or the server. So the server you don't have to do anything on the server because they are all already installed. <laughs> But if you are working from your local uh, desktop machine and you don't have the drivers, then you need to go find them here and install. For the second option, there's a question about this second option of connecting to the database. Yes, you need to install the package. So if you are working with the MySQL backend, you have to install this package at MySQL and load it up. If you're working with the Oracle, uh, 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 backend, so then you have to install the package R Oracle. Same to R SQL. So these are packages that are, are available in CRAN, uh, 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 been contributed by generous people. So yes, you need to install the package the usual way uh, of install.package. So this is the package I'm talking about uh, and this one. So the usual way you install the package, you need to install it, same as ODBC. But when it comes to the drivers, if you run this command for the ODBC list drivers and you don't see a driver that is compatible to your, your uh, database that you're connecting to, either MySQL or SQL or Oracle, then you go ahead on this website and, and, and find it and install it. Is that, is that clear?
Okay. So I, I hope the exercise was smooth. Uh, I think it's, we are, we are a bit two minutes into uh, the second session, the second bit of the, of the, of the, of the, of the workshop. So I'm going to uh, leave it to you. So there are solutions, there are access solutions there. You can come back and uh, look at the, actually, let me just show you where they are. So you come to this folder exercises, you can find them. In the backup and is the solution here. So uh, these are markdowns. So before I proceed, um, I just want to understand uh, the extent of uh, difficulty in accessing these projects. Uh, if you are still having problems setting up your cloud project, please uh, let me know or let John or Chandan know that. That's the case because uh, it's important that you be able to set up this. Okay, so let's proceed. So now uh, we have we have successfully established connection to our database. Now uh, what you want to do is we want to look on look at how using that connection that we have established. So we have established a connection. Um, so we have seen how uh, we can check the number of tables in the connection and pick a specific table and uh, check uh, how many fields or rather how many variables are in that table like that. So I could have picked a different table, DB list, uh, sorry, DB list fields, uh, list fields like that. Uh, then I provide the connection. Uh, let me give the second, the second connection like that, then I specify the name of the table. So this time around, let me probably focus on the baseline uh, table. Okay, so you can see uh, I missed a brackets. Yeah, so you can see um, again, I have five, five uh, variables in the uh, baseline table, which is uh, subject ID, which is the primary key, the DOB, date of admission, uh, sex, and site. So uh, these are dummy databases. They don't contain any real, like any 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 data that is making sense. This is just for demonstration purpose. Okay, so having set up your connection, having established a connection with your database, um, and you have explored the tables, and you have at least explored a specific table of interest, uh, what variables contain. So how do we query data? How do we... Uh, 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 right instruction to get us data into, into R. So that's what you're going to cover in the next few few minutes. So there are three approaches. Um, so the first approach is to use the function from the DBI package. So the DBI package, which I said is the main uh, bridge or the main interface to connecting our studio to R. Uh, it has a some function that can help you, uh, uh, I mean, extract data from the the, 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 the database. So, so uh, the first approach is uh, a two-step way. So whereby you use a function called DB send query. So DB send query takes uh, an argument, which is the connection of the database that you already established and the SQL statement. So this is the normal SQL statement that you write in your SQL, uh, SQL IDE. So select all from where and all those. So the standard SQL, Statement. So just copy it and paste it inside, uh, like like a, a inside the double quotation. And what DB send query does, it uses this connection and sends this instruction to the database. It executes this in the database and returns to you not the data but the results. So then that 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 calls for the second step uh, using the function DB fetch. So which now fetch, it fetches the results that have been returned by, by the DB send query into a proper proper data frame or other data set in R. So that's one way using DBI functions to extract data from your database. Uh, so having said, the, having gone through the two-step function, there's an implementation using DB get query function from again DBI package 
which does all these two steps at a go. So ideally, if you are working with databases and you are extracting or you are doing maybe an automation, you are doing a back and forth, uh, or you're working with multiple connections, I think this first approach is pretty much not the ideal because you'll be running two, you'll be running two, two, two cords while you can run one. So that's that's where DB get query comes in. So DB get query does the same thing, takes the same arguments as the DB send query, takes the connection name to your database and the statement, the, 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 the SQL statement. So what DB get query does, it does these two steps at a go. So it gives, it returns to you the data itself that you've queried using this uh, SQL command or other SQL code. Uh, that's using DBI functions. The second approach you can use to query data from your database, which is the, 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 the climax of uh, the workshop, I think is the theme of the workshop, is by using the deployer syntax. So what this means is that if you ever, if you are working, if you ever written a tidyverse, like you're working with the tidyverse group of packages, meaning you've worked with the deployer before. So there's a package in the back end, uh, it's the DB, deployer, DB which contains the translations of deployer syntax into SQL, SQL code. So what this uh, entails that using the function TBL, you can basically provide the connection to the database and the, the table name. Then beyond there, you write the normal R code that you're used to. So you don't have to write a SQL code. So the first two approaches, just note that you have to write a proper, proper SQL code. So that means you need to know how to write, uh, how to like author a proper SQL, uh, a rather valid SQL code. But for this other approach using the deployer syntax, you only need to establish a connection using this first line, whereby you just call, you, you call, you invoke the TBL function, provide the connection name, which you have established already, and the table name that you want to extract data. Then you can even use the pipe operator. Now go ahead, do some filtering, and do some selection, and arrange your data. So the same way you, you, only, you always work with your data frame in R using the deployer syntax. So the beauty with this is that uh, it doesn't, so whenever you do these steps uh, with this particular approach is that everything else that you are computing here, the computational uh, burden is actually felt in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the database. So what I mean by this is that whatever you get with this code as it is, is not the data, but the glimpse, or rather the, the actual, like the an overview of what is contained in your query. Not unless you use the function collect at the end of the code to be able to now bring in data into memory. Whatever you do here, all uh, all along will just be um, an exploration, and uh, it's sufficient that way because. You don't you don't up, you don't up, you don't end up using your memory much for computation. So and the other advantage of this uh, approach is that you really don't have to know like deep advanced SQL code to be able to interact with the database. You just need to write your usual deployer syntax, and that can be pushed to the database, and you can get your data based on the uh, uh, on your on your on your code. So um, I'm going to. Before I look at the other third option, which I think it's really uh, 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 not a new thing is because you're going to use, uh, obviously, connection that you already established. I'm going to go to my R and uh, do that demo as we see uh, what are the different uh, uh, approaches. Okay, so switching to R, I want to go ahead and uh, use my established connections to execute a query. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, use DB send query and DB fetch, which is the two-step approach using uh, from the DBI package. So that those functions are from the DBI package. So now uh, what I'm going to do here is that uh, I'm going to, for instance, uh, uh, say DB, again, this script, that I'm, the script that I'm writing here is available in the R, Walkthrough script. So if you have, if you want to co copy and uh, follow through, you can find all those codes here. So at this point in time, I am somewhere here. 
And I might not write the exact code, but the idea is the same. Like uh, that's 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 uh, 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 the goal. So DB send a query. Um, so it takes a connection. So I'll give it my DB connection like that. Then it takes uh, the second argument takes the SQL statement. So I'm going to say select uh, maybe all variables from the TBL lab. So I have a table called lab somewhere, and I think so, this one here. And that's it. So what I get here is some results. So I can save that one object. So maybe say this is uh, 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 maybe query, query results or something like that, uh, and assign it to an object and try to explore this object. Uh, like that. So if I run that, did I do something wrong? Um, uh, the statement from, SQL statement from. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, John. So select all from the table that, so that's a complete statement, SQL statement. So then you can try and check the class of this object. Uh, what does it tell you? So the query results, uh, the class of the results object. You see it's a list and it's telling you this is an ODBC result. And if I had to copy this and use uh, my other connection just to be able to, I'll just name it this maybe query results too, but this time down I'm going to use the, the option two connection. Remember the option two connection is the connection that I did, I established using a, D, a DBI uh, compliant, compliant uh, backend package. So I'm going to run that. Um, uh, I could find. Okay, uh, that's strange. So I'm going to uh, try and establish the connection again. Um, okay, seems like I don't know why it closed, but yeah, so class. Uh, the other version like that. And you can see uh, they are pretty much different in some form. Uh, so the other one is a, an ODBC result because I made the connection using ODBC uh, 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 driver. And the other one is a MySQL result because I made the connection using a MySQL uh, 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 compliant, backend compliant package. So Using these results, I can go ahead and fetch them like I just uh, showed you. So because it doesn't contain any data. So if I try to uh, like uh, run it or other, even print it, it doesn't print for me data, it just gives me some, uh, uh, some, some results. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing there. So for me to get that data, uh, that's when uh, DB fetch comes in. So this time around now I'll have an object uh, uh, and this will be maybe query uh, data frame or something. So then use db fetch. Db fetch takes the argument of the, the argument, which is uh, an object result resulting from running db send query. So I'll just put that there and run this. At the end of it, I'll find now I have db uh, query. A data data frame which contains 200, 226 observations and four variables, which is my lab data from my database. Okay, so those two step approach can be done, can be achieved using only one uh, 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 step using the db get query. So in this in this sense, I'll just say, okay, so uh, this is my. Let me focus on maybe base baseline baseline data. So I'll just type baseline. Uh, maybe data like that. Then I'll, 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 invoke, I'll invoke DB get query. So DB get query takes uh, the first argument as the connection of the database. So I'll just maybe use my second uh, the set option two, option two uh, uh, of my connection. Then of course the statement. So this will be the SQL, uh, uh, the, a proper proper valid SQL statement. So I'll say select everything from the table uh, baseline, like that. So, and remember this here can contain any number of lines of SQLite, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that simple. So this is your typical SQLite code that you're writing. So 
it can be multiple lines. This is just for simplicity for, for showing. So uh, I'll need to clear some. Uh, so, so DB. Okay. So DB clear. I hope I'm not, I don't embarrass myself here. Okay. Okay, uh, maybe DB close. So, uh, home. Okay, I'm going to close, uh, I think, uh, some connection here, uh, DB. I think it should be oh. DB, DB disconnect or something. DB. Yeah, DB disconnect, thank you. Disconnect. Yeah, I'm going to disconnect either. I think, uh, let me do like that. Then, so the bad things that I have to go and so that's the disadvantage of that of that approach. So it means I I, I have to close, disconnect, then go back and again uh, and connect. And I think that's not what you will basically want to do. So then I'll do that, and in one go I get my baseline data, which is here, which has 300 observations and five, five variables, which is what is stored in my database. Okay, so having covered the DBI compliant, uh, uh, like DBI function, so let's look at how you can achieve the same using the, the syntax from dplyr. So the syntax from dplyr, what you need to use is the TBL function, and you provide the TBL function with the connection. So I'm going to use my DB connection. Then, of course, with the second uh, uh, argument being the table that you want to work with. So let me work with the uh, clinical like that. So if I run this command, so you see, I get something, I get a, an output. So let's just spend some time looking at this output. So this is the output of the table. Uh, 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 clinical. So you can see it's telling me, uh, so I have six columns, but doesn't know how many rows. So this is because it, this is like, this, these are these are glimpses, these are results of uh, of what I've just run. So this, sim this, similar, this similar with select all from TBL clinical, but I'm not getting the data into my memory yet. So I'm getting an over, like a glimpse or others, uh, a kind of uh, 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 overview of what my data entails. So uh, we can investigate that by storing this into maybe, let's call it a clinical, uh, maybe like that, so object, so uh, some objects. So let's just exploit. So if I run this and do class, so let's just look at what it's contained. So to tell you it's a, a lazy TBL and also a um, MySQL. So what this means is that there are some functions that cannot work with this object. So if we thought maybe this is a, 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 a table, try uh, try running things like n row function, number of rows uh, on it. So maybe I could just use the pipe operator as well. Just go ahead and pick up from where I started here, then go ahead and say, okay, let me find what's the number of rows. So you'll find it to tell you a name because it can't tell yet because it's not a data frame in your memory. So it can't tell, but it can tell you the number of columns because it has already done a glimpse of that. If you run like functions like dimension, any function that requires R to be able to count or work on the, on the rows will fail because this implementation on its own is not a data frame. So if, when I do that, the dimension no, the dimension function gives you the number of rows and number of columns. But you can, you can see it can print correctly the number of columns, but it can't print the number of rows. This is because this the result of this is not a proper data frame. Like this is not data that you can store or you can use. It's just uh, a glimpse of uh, uh, like what that uh, uh, table contains. So for you to be able to get that data into memory. What you need to do is to use the function collect. So using that implementation, you can go ahead and uh, 
continue, you can even say, okay, I want to select maybe the subject ID. Uh, let me just copy for uh, saving time. Maybe you want to collect to select a, a parlor and uh, you want say maybe fever. So you want only three variables. So you can run that and you can see a uh, still, it tells you, okay, uh, Okay, so these three columns, but I don't know the number of rows. So then still, this is not like a proper data frame that you can be able to plot or even do a table or something like that. You can go ahead and say, okay, I want maybe uh, 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 children who are, whose fever status is yes. So you see, these are, this is like a normal syntax for the player. And the moment, the more you write, the more the instruction is being sent to the, the database and you get back your glimpse of the results. But now for you to be able to get this data that you've queried into your memory for use, you have to add use collect. So collect is the function that takes the glimpse, it takes whatever uh, R through the Tidyverse deployer has communicated, has communicated with the database to return and bundles up as a data frame, then returns it to you. So now if I run this, this will be a proper, proper data frame. And you can see now the difference that now I know I have 205 observations and three columns as opposed to what I was running there before. Then you can go ahead and store this as you are data frame uh, 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 in, in R and go ahead and uh, continue using it to plot and do analysis and what for. So it's here. So, and, you can even do a more complex example. So uh, uh, you can probably let's try one more time. So I can go and say TBL. This time around, I want to maybe focus on. Um, uh, uh, so I'll use my DB connection. Then I just want to focus on TBL, maybe baseline. Okay. So I can run fast to see the glimpse what I have on the baseline. So I have like five columns and everything there. And I can go ahead and say, okay, uh, in that table, what I want is I want to filter uh, sex equals to two uh, from the site number, which is three. That. So you go ahead and still you get the glimpse and still it tells you you have five uh, rows, but no, sorry, five columns, but number of submission doesn't know until you go ahead and invoke the function collect. So this is the step that brings the data into your memory to be able to store it into some objects. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, this uh, I'll store this as baseline, baseline df, like that, and run that. So then I have, have baseline df, which is, uh, um, what is it? Uh, sorry. Uh, Okay, I missed a pipe operator up there. So baseline DF, which has 51 observation and five variables as you can see, because it's uh, sex is uh, two and site is number three. So this just tells you that whichever complex code that you normally write using the player can be applied uh, to this approach when you are interacting with the database. The good thing is you can also a good way of learning SQL because you can, actually ask R to print for you the equivalent of this SQL code that you've just written here using, 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 using the player. So what you need to do instead of collect, you go ahead and say, okay, show me the query that was actually executed into the database. So if you run that, then you get the query in the console here. So if you take this query and try using either of these statement up here, where you are required to uh, put a proper proper uh, SQL uh, code, you'll get the same results as what I've gotten from this baseline DF. So I think at that end, uh, I would love to stop there. And uh, I don't know if there's any question in the chat yet, but uh, I want to come back before we could go to, to a break and uh, a little bit of uh, exercise to just give you a picture of 
what we've just done in the last approach for using Deplier. So what happens here is that Deplier has an interface with uh, uh, databases. So this is made possible by another uh, package, which is in, in the background, uh, dbplyr, which translates, uh, rather contains the translation of the syntaxes of dplyr into a SQL code. So what happens is that uh, you write a dplyr syntax code, and uh, which gets translated and sent into the into the into the SQL engine that uh, uh, like connects with your tables and 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 and, and the reports and the metadata and all that, and so this 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 um, I, mean, I mean this um, this communication uh, returns uh, results, which for you to be able to. Uh, uh, to turn them into proper proper table or table or a data frame, you have to collect them using the function collect, and all that is done from within Art Studio. So I hope this picture gives you uh, a simplicity way of viewing it, uh, in the sense that I have a database which is on my SQL or SQL Server somewhere. I don't know how to write a SQL code, but I know how to write a deployer syntax. So then I will uh, leverage whatever. Uh, package is available to connect my R Studio to a database and just write my normal uh, deployer syntax and still be able to achieve uh, uh, the same goal of having my data from the database into R as a as a as a table uh, or other data frame which you can now go ahead and plot and do analysis and, and what have you. Okay, so um, for this approach, I will think in the essence of time. Uh, say a little bit about it, but not demonstrate. This is when you are using, um, uh, 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 so if you go to our markdown, so if I open, if I open, I try to open our markdown file here. Uh, um, so those who have used our markdown, so, or you are using our markdown. So we have we have code chunks. So we have various code chunks. We have R, we have Python, RCPP. So we also have SQL code chunk. So this is a code chunk that enables you to write a proper proper uh, SQL uh, SQL code. So now that I'm actually here, I think I can as well as do it. So you can create a SQL code SQL code chunk in your Markdown. So what happens here is that uh, the SQL code chunk will take the name of the connection which you will have established somewhere up there, and of which we have already here. So maybe I will just say uh, my connection is my. I'm going to use my my DB dot com like that, then inside this uh, uh, code chunk, you see it's SQL code chunk. So then you type a SQL code or other SQL query. So I can just come and paste that. So let me just remove this because I don't think it's necessary. So it's the same thing that I did up there. So I expect if I run this, I should get the same results. But because I haven't saved it to anything, it will just like display on my R markdown here, uh, on, the, on the notebook here. So uh, how to avoid that is to add another argument in your code chunk, which is called output.var. So output.var is just an object that, you, that will contain the results <coughs> from your code that you've run in the code chunk. So in this case, I can name it maybe, <clears throat> let me call it uh, baseline, baseline DF, and maybe option two, because I'm using something else. I'm using a SQL. So when I run this now, I want to get things post, uh, like displayed in my, in, my, in my notebook here, but I'll have an object called baseline DF of, of two in the environment which contains the results of this uh, SQL query, like that. So it's here. And if you look at it, it's the same output with the one that I used when I did uh, this implementation using the deploy uh, syntax. So whichever way you want to use it, there's everything for everyone. So if you have joy writing SQL, raw SQL, you're welcome. You can use the SQL uh, uh, code chunk, or you can go ahead and use this other implementation and write your SQL uh, uh, codes in the, inside there, or you can use, make your life easier by using the deployer syntax. 
So I think that being said, uh, it's time for another break and attempting the exercise two, which is in the exercise folder, this one here, uh, package is already preloaded or rather pre-written, you can load them. There's instruction you can read. So this exercise takes 15 minutes, uh, it's a bit uh, longer, but the idea is uh, you don't have to finish it. Uh, and you can always look up the solutions. So the solution is in this R markdown. And that is like this question number. Uh, so you will look at the outline here. Um, uh, yep, so querying data. So you can go look here and there are a few instructions there. But first of all, try to attempt and see if you can be able to, to replicate these instructions. Uh, yeah, so all the best. And uh, I think we will get back in like, uh, is it, is it uh, 35 minutes past uh, 11, Joe? It looks like so. Yeah, we have a go. question from uh, Gemma. Yes. Um, if I have a if I have a database that I need to use with no lock, can I use Diplier, please, on the chat? So I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with no lock. Uh, is it is this is this uh, maybe uh, Gemma? Can you un unmute and uh, just just talk, please? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So we have some. Um, databases um, um, that we have to put um, the table name and then in brackets we have to put with mine with no lock I think it's something to do with um, not freezing the tables and um, for other people or the users that are using the tables and I'm not quite clear on what it does um, so I know I could add that into the where I send the actual SQL code but I didn't know whether if I wanted to use the dplyr there was a way of doing that as well? Um, honestly, um, I'm not sure, but I think I can look. That's something um, uh, I've never encountered, but I can look into it and uh, see if I can uh, get a response, uh, proper response to you. OK, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so all the best. And uh, let's attempt the exercise. Just know uh, the goal is not to finish it. The goal is to just uh, get to see if you can be able to uh, 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 write a similar code, or if you have a database in mind, that if you can be able to uh, think of it in that way, based on the nature of your data and the kind of data that you extract. So. Yeah, be either using the player syntax or using uh, the DBI function. So yeah, have fun and let's meet in 15 minutes to, to move to session three. So we are here, uh, me, Chandan and John. So just in case, you have a question, you can just post it and uh, we, are, we, are, we are monitoring the chat for any quick help that you can, can give.
how is the exercise going? Anyone? The progress, are the course running? Thanks, Scott. Sure, Luis, you you surely catch up. I think uh, all the materials, the course, and I'm sure the session is recorded, so probably you can review it later. But uh, like I said, uh, I, I will evaluate and see at the end of the workshop if we have say like 10 minutes remaining, I, I will do a debrief. Like I will do an entire debrief run top to bottom of what we just covered today and see if that sinks in well, so, okay. Yes, Zahid, it will be shared on YouTube and yeah. To me, to me. Okay, so I want to move to... Sorry, there's a question, Chris, um, about um, can you make sure it's shared on a YouTube channel? Yes, yes. Uh, Charlotte said uh, it, uh, once the record is ready, it will be posted on YouTube even today. Yeah, it will be shared. It will be shared. Real. Thank you. Okay, so, yep, uh, so I want to uh, go over session two now. And uh, this, is, this entails um, connecting, establishing connection and working with the Red Cup database. Um, I'll do what we did with the first session. I just want to find out through a quick poll, uh, if you have ever worked with a Red Cup database before. So let's do this again. One for yes, zero for no. Wow, wow. Okay. Thanks, okay, seems like virtually no one has ever worked with computer this before, fine, so. Uh, it's good that you have a few minutes. I'll just spend time and give a proper introduction to this database. And probably you might relate because it's one of the databases that are being used in most health research institutions. And um, I'm sure you've come across it in a, a survey or something. So let's get into it. So uh, Red Cup, so that's, that's how it does the logo of the database. RedCap stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. It's a secure web application database for building and managing surveys and databases. So the good thing with RedCap is that bit of having to host a database at the same time host a survey. I'm sure, I don't know, uh, maybe you filled a survey before, which was authored via RedCap. So uh, these days I see most surveys are being, so you know these short surveys, feedback survey for maybe uh, the, the one that uh, previously you find them in survey monkeys and uh, and the, and the, and, the, and the Google Forms. These days, most of the surveys they are being done in Red Cup, and I can probably guess the reasons why because it's very easy to, if you're working with R, it's very easy to extract data from Red Cup. So you don't have necessarily have to log into the database. You just have to have the credentials, the URL, and connect to it. So um, if you want to learn more about RedCup and its usage and its uh, presence in, in, the, in, the, in the research world, head on to this website. Uh, you'll just find a little bit of information about it. 
One thing I want to say uh, about RedCap is that it supports offline data collection. So these are the, uh, the those kind of uh, tools that you can go ahead and do a survey because it has a mobile app. So you know, like the ODK, if you ever worked ODK before or Survey CTO or Cobo Connect. So it has a similar implementation whereby you have a mobile app, you have your, you have your forms uh, created in the web uh, and you have your mobile uh, app where you enter in data and submit, uh, rather push uh, uh, offline. So you, sorry, you collect data on your device, either it's a tablet or a mobile, then when you get an internet connectivity, you can push them to the web uh, database uh, for storage. So it's uh, one of the, I mean, the efficient solution to collecting data where there's limited, uh, I mean, uh, uh, coverage of uh, network connectivity. So I've included some few images. So one of the, the first image is the is the is the the logo of the red cup, and I'm going to dive in shortly about this. So this is just a layout of how red cup is arranged. So we have what we call the forms. The forms are the questionnaires. Then we have uh, on the, the 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 columns are basically the time points. So if you are doing a longitudinal study whereby you're collecting data in base, at baseline, maybe discharge, month three. So you can designate that. So you can find a very, you can, you can, you can find a very complex database design red cup that can capture like a very diverse uh, 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 types of data. And the good thing with red cup is that there is also the aspect of data access groups, whereby you can have one database being used by several sites, just one database, like there's no instances, but each site enters data and, 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 and like they only see data that is specific to their site. So I'm just going to go to the web uh, and just show you what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe it will make more sense. So this is Red Cup, I'm just going to open and log in. So this is how it appears. Uh, so it's a web-based database, as I said. And uh, yeah, so a little bit about it here and everything. So you can log in. So once you log in using your username and the password, so this is the landing page. So you have the RedCap, you have the my projects, you want to create a new project, and the, it, it has versatile training materials, uh, videos, and what have you on how to get started, create a database, and uh, start collecting data. So this tab here of my projects is what list. So this, if you click on my project, it will list for you the number of projects that you have in your this particular uh, link as or server server instance. So you can have several projects. You know, it's not limited for it's not limited to one. So you can have you can manage various projects. So I created one here for use today, but you can have this list can grow can grow. You can have as many projects as your server can can host in this same one link, and you can ma manage them however you want user rights and and everything. So I'm going to open this project just to see the layout, how it appears. So this is the setup. So this is where you start by creating, defining whether you want a longitudinal data, you want a cross-sectional, uh, how do you want to um, like uh, have your, your record ID named and everything. So this is not important uh, because it's more of, of design end than even usage. So I just want to take you to the user, usage end. So once the database is ready, how is it being used? <clears throat> so usually, on the left hand side, you come to this red link here, add edit records. Then you can see, so I have 300 records for test today, which is the same database that we used in the SQL light. So it's familiar. So you can go ahead and uh, enter a new or an existing record. So maybe I want to add a new record, just go ahead and maybe type the ID, the new ID. Then it will open for you the first form, uh, the layout of the form. So it's telling you that for this record ID, this is the possibility. So we have baseline time point, we have month three time point, we have month six time point, and we have study and time point. And for each of the data collection instance, so demographic information is only done at baseline. Admission uh, case report form, the CRF is only done at admission or the or baseline. Lab results is being collected at each and every time point. So if you are familiar with longitudinal data, so this is how it works here. It's very simple and follow up. CRF, those are, these are all case report forms or questionnaires. So follow-up questionnaire, study exit questionnaire, lab result questionnaire, and follow-up questionnaire, as it indicates, is only collected at month 
three and man six and so forth and so forth. And you can go ahead and start entering data from any point in time. So if, for example, I wanted to do, okay, now this patient ID, I only have results, lab results for baseline. So you can go ahead and click that gray balloon. Then you go ahead and do what? Put the results there and, and save. So I'll just put uh, some dummy things there that don't really make sense. And I collect it today. Then I can say save and exit. So then you can see, okay, now the, this 785, ID 785 has some data at baseline. It is red because it's incomplete, but if I'm sure that's the data needed, so I can just turn this to green, to green by just changing the cell to complete. So that's a little bit about the data entry end of the red cap. So the setup end whereby you define your events, you can come here and now, if for example, you decide to have another time point included. So this is where you add that time point. For example, I want, okay, and maybe discharge, so you can always, always add it here and uh, go back to, to designate instrument and probably uh, say where you want to add that particular uh, 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 form. So if I wanted to, for example, okay, follow-ups questionnaire should also be, be completed at the study end. I'll just come here and say begin editing and check this box and say, okay, now from now going forward, this follow-up CRF or questionnaire must be also com be completed there at, at, at the study end. But that's not what I, I desire. Finally, uh, talking about connecting data uh, R to red cap. So I want to finally uh, uh, take you through this. If you go on, on the left bottom, uh, sorry, somewhere uh, closer to the end uh, of the panel, you'll see a small link APIs. So it's API, APIs for application. Uh, API means application programming interface. So, this is where you connect, this is where you get the credentials to connect your red card database and R. So what you get here is the A token. Usually it doesn't come automatically, you need to request it. Uh, usually a new database does not, does not have a, a, an API token. It just has a request button. So you request, then your administrator will approve. And whoever is the administrator of that particular database will approve, then you see it appearing here. So this is what you need one, which is the API token, which is like the password and everything. The other thing you need is the URL. So URL is the, of course, the, 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 the link to your database. So how I normally advise, uh, 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 so the most, the most common mistake is to use this URL up here as the one for connecting. And honestly, uh, usually it's not the case. So usually I advise one to come to ready, ready cap API documentation up here, just click on that. Then to open another page here, which contains everything about the token, how to obtain, how to troubleshoot errors, how to export stuff, how to do all those stuff, all those things within the API. Then you scroll down to export records somewhere here. So the first item is the URL here. So this is what you pick. So, and this is what I've provided on the database info here. So if you look at what I provided here is I have this, then I have the URL the database link. This is the main link where I logged in. Then this is the URL. This is the, what I'm showing you right now uh, here. So what you need is the URL. And the difference is you can see it's at the end for slash API, meaning application programming interface. So you need that and you need the token for you to connect your R2. Uh, the red cover database. So now, having said that, I'm going back to my slides to continue with the, uh, the, the with, the, with, 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 with this, this bit. So, so uh, having looked at um, uh, red cup and uh, the layout and uh, the time points which you call the instruments so of month, uh, 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 month. Uh, three, month six, study end or baseline. So you can use various packages available for you to connect to RedCap. So there are several. So there's one, uh, my favorite is the RedCap API. And there's one called RedCap R. Uh, there's one that recently came up, which was a bit uh, very exciting. I've never explored it, but there are always solutions to this. But I like RedCap API because it's been here for a while and I believe it's very stable in that sense, and it has very clear, clear functions to be able to interact with RedCap. And this RedCap data is, um, and, uh, I would say, it's a local solution 
that we we we, we used to work with uh, in my previous uh, job, and it's not available in uh, in, uh, in in Kran. So this is a kind of a, a, a more sped up version of Red Cap API because we've done a little bit of um, uh, uh, like changes there to just be able to do things in parallel. So uh, yeah, okay. So the first step to connecting your data, your database, your R to database to create a connection. So and the story is the same. You have the connection name, then you provide the credential. So use the function Red Cap API, Red Cap connection from the package Red Cap API. So you provide the URL, the one that I showed you here. Uh, this one you provide that you provide that URL. Then the second thing you provide your R with is the token. So the token is that uh, alphanumeric code that I just showed you somewhere here. So once you have those two. You're good to go. You connect and you begin interacting with your data database from R. So you can interact with database, your database, Red Cup database using two options. You can export or rather extract data by event. So by what I mean by event is that the columns I showed you. So like if I go to, I go back, I just go back to this um, uh, uh, setup. And say define Sorry, guys, I think I might have lost my connection. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'll just do a, a repeat of that. That's this, this, uh, it's very embarrassing. So, so let me know you're able to see my, my pricing. Okay, uh, seems like it's not working. Uh, okay, so are you able to see my screen now? Anyone, please? Yes, I can see. Thank you, thank you. So I think I lost my connection when I was about to, I was explaining something with um, connecting, extracting data event wise. So you extract by, by event. So, and I was about to just, Say something what about what is an event. So if I come to my setup here, then say define define events. So uh sorry, designate event. What I was saying is that in baseline, I have these three information being collected. So then if I say I want to extract only the baseline, I get information for these three 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 questionnaires. If I say I want to get data for month three, the story is the same. So in month three, I only get lab results and study. Uh, sorry, and follow up uh, 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 form. So you can extract data in that manner. You can extract by event, uh, event wise, or you can extract by instrument wise. So instrument wise is that you now say, okay, I need data for demographic, regardless of where it's being completed. I want data for lab results. So you specify the lab results, regardless of which event this lab results is being entered. So having said that, I think. Uh, I will um, uh, move to R and try to demonstrate that. Uh, I hope it makes sense. 
Okay, so I am here. So, and I have my URL ready. So RedCap connection is a function from the RedCap API package. So RedCap connection takes the two arguments, the URL, which is the, the one that I showed you and how to find, which, which is like a pointer. Let's, 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 uh, let's uh, equate it to the, the host, the host or uh, uh, the, 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 the host name or rather the sub address for the relational database management system. Then the token, is basically your password. So like it's, this is what gives it the permission to be able to go into your red cup and pull the data. Okay, so uh, I'll run this to just get the connection moving. So I could always just check the class of this, this thing. It's telling you the class of that is just a red cup API connection. And you can go ahead and now use this connection the same way we used the ones for uh, databases, relation databases to explore the various components of this red cap database that I've just uh, taken you through. So the first thing you can do is to just check the number of events, how many events and what are the names of the events, because you need those the names of the events to be able to connect to the, to, to extract it. So uh, there's a function from the same package uh, named export events. So everything in this package is export. So export events, export records, export instruments, export metadata and export everything, export arms, export everything. So export events takes uh, the first argument as the connection. So you give it the connection, the, R, the red cap connection, which I've already created there. And if I run this, I get this data frame here, which gives me the event name. I think you saw them. So baseline, month three, month six, and study end. And of course, the unique name. So baseline underscore arm. So it's because I only have one arm. I didn't, I didn't create uh, two two arm study. So it's a one arm. So then these the, these are the unique. This the unique. The unique names is what we we'll use to extract the data. So going forward, I can probably look at the instruments. How many forms, or rather, how many questionnaires are in that database? I'll say export instruments. Sorry, export instruments like that, and provide it with a connection. Like that, like that, my red cup connection. Then it will tell you, okay, in your, in your database, you have this number of instruments. So you have five questionnaires. You have the demographic, you have the admission CRF, you have lab results, you have follow-up, and you have study exit. Okay. Then you can go ahead and uh, look at metadata. Metadata is just like, um, it's like, um, data dictionary. So of all the variables in your database, uh, what are their class, if it's a categorical, what are, what are they coded like? So that's what the metadata gives you. So I'll just name it so that we can be able to view it. So meta, metadata, then I'll say export metadata like that and provide a connection, which is my red cap connection like that. So I have it here in my environment, I'll open it and you can see it's basically the variable name, which form the variable is, 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 is completed or rather is residing, the type of the variable, whether it's a text, a yes, no, or a radio button, the label, that is the question that will be seen on the screen whenever it's being, data is being entered. And if it's a, if it's a, like a selection. So what, are, how, how are they coded? It's one for male, two for female, and hospital, like the real label ones, hospital A, and like that. So this is like, I'll say the easiest way to get a data dictionary from Red Cup. Otherwise, you can always come here and go to, I think, code book, then get it here. So it's the same thing here. So whichever way works, but I always find Either way, fine. So this is the code book for, 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 for the for the for the for the diction, for the database. Okay, going back to my R, I can export arms as well, but I don't want. Let's just skip that uh, in the sense of time. Then go to the to the juicy part whereby we want to export the data. So now, how do I get my data into R from Red Cup? You can guess, my guess is as good as mine, you're going to use the function export records. So you just type export records like that, then provide the connection, okay? 
my connection is my red cap connection. So then you can probably name this object and say this is a red cap data. So if I run this command, I will get an object named red cap data in my environment. And that object will contain my entire data set from this database uh, here. So just take a time to look at how uh, it looks like. So it's extract entirely everything. So the record ID, the event name, and if you can see it, the data comes in a long format. So whereby an ID appears as, as many times as I think uh, the number of uh, uh, unique uh, uh, forms being uh, completed. So uh, as you can see, there are some blanks and everywhere and so forth. So there's a way to go around that and we'll cover it. But yeah, so this is the simplest way to get data. And just a disclaimer, this option only works for small data sets, for more small databases. So if you have a very huge database, this will not work because it will take time to be able to extract all your data set at a go. So this is for small data sets, like small studies. You can have, there are big studies that have like thousands and thousands of records. You can't possibly do that with those big data sets. And that's uh, uh, my next uh, item of extracting that data bits by bits. So what you can do with those big data sets, the databases, is you can extract bits by bits. So you extract event by event or form by form. Then at the end of it, use your data management uh, uh, like uh, 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 capabilities to be able to merge them together. So for instance, if I wanted to only extract baseline data, so data for baseline event, so you can always check the help for export records and just see the various options available. And uh, I'm just going to copy this because this is what you're going to adjust so that you can be able to extract what we want at what point. So I'll just paste it there and uh, remove these. These are necessary, I think, uh, the defaults. Then remain with Archon, but I will supply the Archon, which is my radical database, and I want to extract the baseline data. So I'll go up and remind myself of the events. So what are my events? What events do I have here? I have baseline, man three, man six, and study end. So what I want to extract is the baseline. So what you provide to the export records under the argument event is the unique name of that event name. So which is the baseline underscore and one. So I'll take that, come here to the events and provide it as a, as a string. Then maybe uh, 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 assign this, expression to an object. So I think I'm missing a bracket, I'll close it that. And I will execute this. Um, I used the wrong connection. I used my DB connection instead of using red cup, red cup, uh, my red cup connection. So yeah, just take notes and just put it here. So if I run that, I get my data, I get my baseline data. So if I go to my environment, not based, yeah, if I got my environment, I just, let me just name it to avoid confusion. I'll say baseline red cap, like that. So then if I go to my environment, I'll see baseline red cap, which is has 301 observations. And you can see how that appears. So you can see the red cap event name is only the baseline. So suppose I wanted to, obviously, maybe in my data set, I only want, Maybe I want to I want baseline and man three only, so so that I can have demographic information, admission CRF case report. So sorry, uh, CRF lab results for baseline time point and man three. What I'll do is nothing like really different, just to add another event in this argument events. So I'm going to copy this and paste it down here because I want to export. Uh, Baseline and study exit, sorry. So what I need to do here, maybe I'll say, okay, this is baseline and exit data. Um, then I, why I go ahead and remind myself of the events that I have. It's very important. So I have baseline, month three, month six, and study end. So the study end, the unique name of the study end is study end underscore am one. So I'll come pick this and just come and add it here. 
as a vector. So you have a vector of, of events that you want to extract. So bracket and concatenate. So this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in events baseline and study end. And I run this command. I end up with an object called baseline, exit, which has 601 objects, 601 observation. The reason why it has 601 observation is because uh, it's a long format. So meaning each record is appearing twice, one for baseline, one for study end. So it's a long format data. And like I said, this is something you can always, uh, 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 like if you don't want it to appear that way, you can do something else. So you can extract separately, then combine. So um, I think uh, we are at 12 for five and I think we are like one hour, almost uh, 25 minutes to go. I think that's pretty good time left. I would like to demonstrate what I mean by extracting separately and combining. So of course, in the exercise, if you go in the exercise, which is exercise three, exercise three is all about doing that. So like, um, uh extracting the data in in in, in different uh, time uh, so, sorry events and uh, ex and combining so i have elaborately created a solution like you can also see how like the thinking how to extract how to clean how to combine and uh, have like a, a wide format but i think uh, based on the fact that i uh, from the poll, it seems like no one has ever interacted with this uh, database. I think it's fair to leave you with that at your free time. Just go look at it. At least, maybe, maybe it's never going. It's not going to be very useful to you. Uh, what I want to do now is, uh, I'll give us a small break so that we can leverage some time at the end and cover something to do with automation and the SQLite serverless database once I have covered the API security. So, uh, but if you want to look at the exercise, please go ahead, it's exercise three, and there's the solution here. Uh, and uh, let's meet back uh, in, in five minutes, in 10 minutes. So, so let's meet back at uh, uh, 16 past. Sorry, 17 past 12. So, uh, yeah. So I'll suspend that exercise, not mandatory. This exercise three. Uh, but you can look at it if you so we So I'll convert this part to a break so that we can have a small rest and come and tackle the security bit of this API. Okay. See you, see you in a bit. You can also spend maybe this time to uh, maybe go back to the exercise, the previous exercise, if you did not complete. But uh, yeah, um, I'm not expecting like uh, you to try out this exercise three. So you can look at it later because I mean, it's just too much to get to know database today and start 
connecting. Maybe in the future you'll come across it and the, the scripts will come in handy.
um, cellular bug. Uh, yeah, it's 17 past 12. Uh, yeah, so we have like an hour and maybe 13 minutes, that's enough to, to achieve the goals and uh, do something I thought I could not be able to do, the automation. So, okay, so I'll close this that we used a while. So I hope you're able to access the exercises and the solutions uh, without any problem. My idea was to run these, knit them into HTML and send, but I think I uh, had forgotten. So, but if you open, these are markdowns, you just find a few instructions and the thinking behind it. So uh, for both the relational database management system and uh, and the red cup. So the next two session, the next session does not have any exercises, just best practices. So I'm going to go to my slides and get into it. Okay, so so there's a question that was asked way uh, uh, at the start of the workshop, uh, and uh, I was very happy because uh, simply showed that. Whatever someone looked at this and said that's so dangerous. Yes, I agree. Having this in your script is very dangerous. If someone, if this thing lands into wrong hands, uh, you'll be in trouble. Based on the user rights, the specific user has damage can be caused in your database, not only for relational database manage, uh, management system, even for RedCap, because RedCap also has. Other than export, it has import. So import so it's a bit confusing. So it's export from Red Cup to R. So then import <laughs> to Red Cup. So import is like writing. So you're writing something to database when it comes to Red Cup. So uh, having said that, uh, so API is a concern because an API or other the credentials basically means you're giving. If they, if they get uh, into some scrupulous people's hands, it means they have access to your database and they have all the rights that you have to your database. So, and this, I think, without a doubt, will cause a data breach. And uh, uh, you can lose your data, you can, I mean, can be stolen and can be used uh, uh, on uh, uh, for purposes that were not intended. So therefore, with that in mind, and with the good flow that we've seen, uh, how you can effortlessly connect database to R, uh, to R and use uh, tidyverse or deployer uh, syntax to, uh, to be able to extract data, it's good to take care, good care and manage the security of the APIs and the credentials. So one such way, that I've used before, and that's what I want to show you, is by using one of our startup file. So I'm not sure if you ever heard about this. The, I think I know. I don't. I only told. I only know two of our startup files. Our startup. I only know two. Uh, uh, I know app.environ, which we are going to, to, to actually look at. And I know the other one is um, uh, R. Um, uh, profile. So I don't know which, which chapter. But yeah, so this book, Efficient Programming, has a chapter here. I can't remember where. But uh, it has it covers something to do with startup files. So, and I'm going to just look at one of those, which is the R dot sorry dot R environ. So uh, dot R environ uh, is uh, one of the startup files, which it's not stored. It's 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 not, so if you create it, it's not stored in your project. For instance, if I create it here. It doesn't get stored in my project. It, it, it doesn't exist here. So for instance, if I'm, I'm collaborating with someone on GitHub, all I need to do is 
exclude the dot r environment from being committed uh, if it's existing that is and i don't think it exists so if you create it so in the context of the local desktop uh, the local machine so it will mostly be saved in your documents folder which i'm very sure that folder is obviously even with the OneDrive and uh, Google Drive, it doesn't get synced. So it's like, it stays in your machine. So, so this is how you use uh, r.environ to secure your API. So first you have to open it or create it. So how you create it is by typing file.edit, then uh, the quotation, then tilde sign forward slash dot r environ like that sorry environ so if i run this command a file will open which is named dot r environ but it's empty because i didn't have it before so it doesn't have anything so this is where you hide your apis so this is where you will hide your your credential you hide your api you hide your you hide your uh, URL, you hide your host, you can hide basically anything that you don't want to be visible to anyone. So let's start by probably uh, hiding everything from this connection. So maybe I can leave the driver, then hide the rest. So I'll come to the r.environ uh, and create, uh, create uh, variables, the same way you create an object in R. So for instance, I'll say, okay, uh, I'll create a, an object called server. So that will contain my server. So maybe, maybe I can say server address like that. Then I come and copy this. Let me cut it actually and paste it here uh, like that. And do the same for maybe database, I want to hide the database. I don't want anyone to know the name of my database. So you can just come and say, okay, db, data name, database name. So you can name these things anything. So this is just a nomenclature. And I can come and most importantly, hide the user. So come and create a, an object user. So maybe username. So this will be your username. And obviously, hide the password. Remove the password, come and create, so I can, okay, let me say, um, uh, hiding my credentials, something like that. So then you can come and say, okay, my password, PWD, or rather user password, you can name it anything. So this is just a name, so you can, something that you can remember. So then you're done. So save it, then come to your connection, remove everything that you think you don't want anyone to see. So I remove the database name like that, like that, like that, like that. Maybe I can leave the driver, of course, the comma there, comma there, comma there, and like that. So how do I reference what I've hidden here? So remember, I need, for me to connect, I need the server, I need the database name, I need the user inter a user identification, and the password, which I have hidden somewhere here in the in the server address. So first, I want to mention for once the first time you create this r.environ, because this is a startup file for R, you have to restart your 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 session for it to pick up because it's a startup file. So I'll restart my R session. Uh, that means it will obviously uh, expect it to, to remove everything. So I'll go ahead and uh, force it to remove everything from the console, from the environment. And uh, again, restart. So now uh, I've written my credentials here, server address, database name, username, and password. So now I want to create a connection using those hidden credentials, which if this script is shared with someone, they will never know what was contained in those uh, particular uh, uh, like uh, input mask. So I'll go ahead and load my packages because I've started my, 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 my session. So then for you to access 
a variable containing um, so for you to access a variable hidden in the .r environment, which contains your credential, use the function system sys.get environment. So sys for system. So system.get environment. Then inside system.get environment, you provide the name of the hidden object that you want to reference in quotation. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, what I want you to get me is the server address. So you bring this and copy it here. So you do the same for database, system.getenviron. Uh, the name of the database is uh, database name, that. Then again, user, 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 user ID, system.getenviron. You come and get the username. And finally, system.getenviron, then you get the password. So, what happens here, what is happening here is that these things are only specific to your machine. So like, if I give you this, if I give you this script and you run, so let me run first and see if it works. It worked. I have connected to my database without necessarily having to show anyone my credentials. So I can go ahead and list my tables, uh, DB, these tables. Maybe I should have taken this, down to session three. Sorry, I mixed up. So I'll just come here. So then I can go ahead and say, okay, DB list tables, and my DB connection, this one here. And there I go. So if I try to run this independently, it will show me what is there. But one thing you need to know is that if I give you this script, uh, it won't run. Like it doesn't, it won't, it won't be able to see this, this, these variables because they don't exist in your system. They don't exist in your computer. So this R dot environment is specific to me, specific to this session. If you are using local, um, like a, a, a laptop or a desktop, it is specific to your laptop. Even if you are collaborating and you decide to commit to GitHub, like you push your changes to GitHub, this, st this sticks with your computer and it will always be in your computer, not unless you delete it. So then what that means is that uh, nobody is able to use or rather access your database, even if they get hold of your script, because whatever system dot in, dot get environment is trying to reference from the server address, which is in your R dot environment, does not exist in their environment, not unless you share with them this file, which is what we are saying is the secret margin. You should keep it secret. That's the thing that you need to secure because it will contain uh, bits of what you don't want people to see. Hi, Chris. Yes. We have a hand up from Luis. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Hi, Um. thank you for explaining that. I just wanted to double check that say you've got like different databases that you're trying to um, look in at for different projects that you work on. You just have a list in that R um, environment that's just got like all the different names of what they might be. Exactly. So I can go ahead and say now I want to hide red cup things here. So I can go ahead now mm. and go to my red cup. Where is my red cup? Bring this go back there and uh, try to save it. So try to hide it. So I'll say this red cup URL and this red cup API and of course provide those details. So I just I've copied, I've pasted here because I want uh, an easier way to get them. Put it there so you can hide as many credential as you wish. Doesn't have to be for the databases. It can be maybe your Twitter API, your your Google account uh, access uh, whatever authentication. So I can save it and because uh, I have to restart because I've created something new here. So again, I'll do mm. restart, but the, the one for Red Cup will work. So if I do restart, I come ahead and uh, load the packages, go down to Red Cup uh, connection. So now instead of, instead of using the bare URL and token, I just go ahead and say, okay, I have something hidden in the r.environ and I want you to get it system.getenviron. Then I don't know what I named it, red cup URL. 
So you say red cap, you are out like that, as well as this one, system mm -hmm. don't get environment. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. So system dot get environ. What I need from you is red cap API. So the only thing you need to be careful about is the naming. Okay. So because if you name, if I if I had named this one here, user, username, username, I think that will bring confusion. So you just need to be clear about the naming and remember what you named what uh, in terms of your credential. So if I go ahead and run this. I have the connection without necessarily having to expose my credentials. And that's how it works. So, so just to, um, just to um, follow up on understanding how it works, when, when, you're, in, when you're in on your own machine, then mm -hmm. those things will be visible. You could print them, um, like if you just wrote, part, like use a password and asked it to show you what user password is. But if you tried to do it and it wasn't, and I had created it, then you wouldn't be able to print it on your machine. Yes, you won't. So maybe if I and try to, if I try to, sorry, go ahead. Sorry for cutting you. That's okay. And I just wanted to, because like the way that I normally have to access databases is through a like um, online uh, remote net, uh, connection. And so if, do I put this in my OneDrive and is it still like protected there from other people looking at it? Because obviously now I've got an exposed password that's not, um, you know, it's just in a file that someone could look at on my, on my kind of like saved areas. We're not supposed to use our um, my documents at all anymore. So everything's in the cloud. So I just so, wanted to ask about that security. So do you use do you use um, do you work with the R R or R Studio in any case? Uh, yes, R Studio inside of Udal, which is the inside of. Udal. Okay, so what happens, for example, I just this is now my local like desktop. Uh, I think this is my lock my 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 desk my desk, my R in the desktop. So I'm just going to do file dot edit on that. Just want to show you uh, maybe if I understood your question correctly. Uh, so tilde forward slash dot R environ. So I have a couple of things here. Uh, and uh, I just want to try and, uh, I don't know, stress it just to show you where it is and why I normally say that uh, if, so not unless you are changing computers, that's the other bit, not unless you are changing computers uh, um, uh, each and every time. So for example, if I was having a project that is in, in OneDrive, for instance, and uh, I have created the r.environ in my work computer. Then I come home, I try to work with that project, which is in, uh, in OneDrive, in my home laptop. Then I'm trying to ac access the same variables from the environment that I created, I created uh, using the work computer. It won't work because mm -hmm. it is not in your laptop. It is in the desktop that you created it. So that's the difference. So I don't know if that makes sense. It's just that, like, the way that it's kind of like, because it's a remote desktop, it is basically is another computer, right? Like, it's not on my desk. I don't have R that I use on my actual laptop. I only have R in the environment that I log into securely. So then it will, the R.environment will remain in that session where you're using it. So, uh, yeah. For, example, yeah, for example, if you are, so if you try to, if you try to do the same thing in your the laptop you're using to access the remote uh, 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 like the remote uh, space that you are allowed to, it won't work. Mm -hmm. it, will, yeah. it will it won't sit because it exists it exists in the session, and uh, in this case the session for R dot environ is the system. So if for example we are working in the cloud, the session here is, I don't know if Charlotte was here will have told us, but I'm sure it's somewhere in the in the home, something on the cloud here. Uh, I can't find it. Yeah, it's here. You see where it is? Mm. Uh, Christopher, is it, um, is it a virtual machine, do you think, that Louise is kind of yeah, getting, is. getting herself into? It's a virtual, it's isn't okay. it? Virtual environment. I think, I think Lynn's um, response in the comment is a good one. 
I'll I'll direct it there. Okay, 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 fantastic. Thank you. So, Thank uh, you. Yeah, but uh, so just to, to to drive that point home is that uh, uh, the R dot environ uh, gets created in a folder outside your studio project in the machine or in the system that you're using. So for example, my project is here. As you can see, I don't have uh, the r.environ, but it's been created somewhere outside my project. So if I was to share my project, you wouldn't be able to access this r.environ. You will only access this bit, but you won't access my home because this is specific to me. So that's how it works. So even if you are to recreate this project again and run this script with the, you can experiment and see and run this script with the, with the, with this kind, this particular implementation, it won't work because you don't have, if you go back to your cloud and home, then you won't, you don't have this, but unless I send you this file specifically. And that is the security. Any, any question? Any question on guarding the API security and uh, anything that's not clear? Okay, so, uh, yep, we have a few minutes left. So, uh, if there's no question about the, 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 the security of the API, which is very vital, always, Always, always. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be an API uh, only. So there are things that maybe you don't want, uh, 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 like they're open, uh, to be open to the outside world. Yeah, so those are some of the things you need to like hide away from, from your scripts. So, and use the, I'm sure there's, there are other implementation, but at least this has worked for me for a while. The art environment. So, just to add on this, for efficient collaboration, so for example, if we are working on something together, so maybe uh, I and John are working in this project whereby we are accessing the same database, and maybe we are, we are working from GitHub and the collaboration thing. So one of the efficient ways to be able to uh, abuse the pain of uh, changing scripts over and over again at this point in time you could agree with your collaboration team to name these things the same way. So you have the same server address because you are accessing the same server anyway. So just make sure rather agree to have it have it, to, to have it uh, contain the same name, like the uh, a consistent name all through. The same to this, the same to this. And so what changes is that in John's user, he'll put his username. In my uh, and I'll put my username, same to password. In John's uh, computer, he'll put his password. And in my end, I'll put my password. So what happens is that whenever you're working in a script like this, nothing changes at all. Because if I do something, I push it to GitHub, John pulls. Whenever he runs system.get environ username, his R, or rather R studio understands where to go and fetch what. So it will obviously go to R environ, and fetch for username. And at that point in time, the username that you will find there is John's username, not my username. So similar to my end as well. So that way, there's no reason to change things. Like maybe if John named his uh, user something different, then it needs, if you're working on the same script, it will, it, will, it, will, it will require him to come and name this object differently. Then when he, when he commits that script again, when I get it, I have to do the same. So again, that brings about pain. So that's one of the ways you can collaborate well with this uh, r.environ file or startup. So the second one doesn't really add much is the R profile, you can look it up. So um, I have never found a good usage for R profile, but usually sometimes back, I, I always wanted to open up an R project and get all my packages loaded. So for instance, uh, instead of, because I know I need these packages for this project, I don't want to have them in each script or oh, load packages, load packages, load packages. So then you can use r.profile to be loading. So the moment you uh, start up R, 
uh, whatever is in the R profile is being executed. So if you are data, if you are if you are reading data, if you are loading packages, that gets done each time you open that project. So which I think I don't know. I don't think it's that useful, but it's to mention that it exists. So you can you can also create it the same way with R dot environ. So you can just come here and say uh, dot dot R profile. So this is basically the profile. So and so our profile gets stored in your basically in your project. So if maybe I create something, I say, okay, whenever I open my project, I will want you to always load these packages for me. I don't want to be writing each and every time uh, 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 to load packages. So you close that and you restart. And uh, I think. Uh, if it didn't, if it did, yeah, I think that it did, it did so. So I started. Then you can see it's attaching packages and everything. So maybe now if I try to do something like DB lists tables, that function is available even if I have not loaded DBI package. So that's how it works. I honestly don't think it is that important. And uh, in that sense, I'm sure it is important, but not in this sense. So I will not want packages to be loaded each time I. So I'll just move that, but that's. That's the slightest I could like. I could think of how to use R profile because it's different from R environment because it is within your project. So it gets it's this file that gets executed each time you restart or open a project, a specific project. So so R profiles there are many for there. It's different for each project. So that's the difference. So R pro, R profile. Uh, if you have five projects, R, pro, R Studio projects, you must, so and you want to implement R profile, you have to have five R profiles, five, these ones. But for the R.environment, it's just a single one for your computer. So it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter which project you are working with, so long as you are working with the, uh, a credential that needs to be hidden and you, you are already hidden it in the .R pro, uh, environment, that will work. So you don't have to create R.environment files each time you create a project. So that's, I just want to make that clear. Okay, so I think that's it. So good thing we have uh, like about 45 or what minutes to just cover this. And uh, I can't wait to show you how you could do the automation. But uh, so first, first things first. So we have covered uh, MySQL, I was unfortunate not to, 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 to get a SQL uh, server kind of uh, environment for us to see how it works. But I will say it's the same implementation using ODBZ uh, driver. So we have this very light database called SQLite database. So this one uh, is a portable one. So what this means is that you don't need a server to, to have a database, a relational database, uh, SQLite, for instance. So what uh, this entails is that you can have like medium to large data stored in your SQLite databases and try to maybe cut down on computational costs in your memory. So I use this SQLite database mostly for like creating shiny apps. So for shiny apps, sometimes when you have shiny apps that are reading CSV, heavy CSV or or text text files or whatever flat file. I with time I noticed I don't know I did some test and uh, I I I compared. So reading data from so when you if you have a shiny app that is reading data from a CSV or a text file, it's quite slower. In fact, very slow compared to a data uh, a, a shiny app reading reading the same data set that is has been stored in the SQL databases. So the reason being this kind of implementation, the one that I showed, I just showed you, whereby you do all the things you want to do. You mutate, you select, you do everything, and only pull to the memory what you need. So I think my my hypothesis is that this is the bit that makes it uh, efficient. Because if I were if I were reading, if I was using a CSV, it said it then means I'll be I'll be doing all these things within my within the memory of. The, sh the shiny session and that will slow it down. 
but for the for the for the SQL databases, the heavy lifting is done by the database. Then you only collect to the shiny whatever you need. So let's get uh, uh, to, let's see what this entails. So uh, I'll just load the library and my SQLite. And so, like I said, sorry, R, R SQLite, sorry, R SQLite. So uh, SQL, SQLite is a, is a serverless portable. So meaning you can create it and have it like, like any other file within your, within, your, within your folders. So I'm going to create one. So I'm going to create a, a database. So you create the database using the same syntax that we just used. Uh, of DB Connect. So I'll just say this is my SQLite uh, DB. And I'll say DB, DB Connect uh, like that. And uh, of course, uh, the driver I'm using is SQLite like that uh, from my RMI SQLite. Then I can provide the, the path to where I want to save it. So then for now, I want to save it somewhere here. But uh, you can always have like subfolders. So I just want to say test SQLite.db. So if I run that, you'll see there's a file that's, that has been created here, uh, which is test SQLite.db. So this is actually an, a database that you can, you can connect to using the same, same implementation. So I can go ahead and say, okay, DB list tables for this SQLite. Mm, uh, DB and it has zero, so it doesn't have any 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 data. So I can load data. So for example, I was I have a, I have uh, some data set I want to work with, and uh, I feel like uh, working working with the data the data sets from the SQL DB will be much faster for my shiny app. So then you can write you can I mean you can load them and you can use the function DB write DB write table. So the write table takes the connection. So the connection is the connection of the database that you want to write into. And obviously then we have, uh, so I'll just, I don't remember the syntax very well. So I'll just uh, consult the B write help. Just see what we need. So I, I know there's a connection, then the name. So name, Name here is the name of the table. So what do you want to name the table inside your database? Okay. And the value is what are you writing to that database? So which table, which data set? So I want to start by going up and uh, probably creating uh, this connection. So this connection here that has our data, 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 data sets and the uh, Try to replicate the same using SQL like DB. So I'm going to just uh, DB list table for that prior uh, connection, which is a DB list table of my DB connect. So I want to, um, okay, that did not work. So maybe try sometime. Or I can use, let me use uh, the NYC uh, 13 flight. So I'll just say library NYC. I'm sure you you come across these uh, data sets before. So it has like about five tables. So I'm just going to use the first three. And uh, let's go ahead and see. So uh, these databases, these data sets are, so these airplanes, these airports, these flights and everything. So I'm just going to maybe do the first three and you can get this the, the genes of what happens here. So the name is the name of the table. So actually this is how I created the database NYC flight 13 that uh, we is part of what you need to play around with. So I'll just give the names, so, okay? The name of the table will be called, so I normally like having this prefix to a table, TBL. So TBL airlines. Then whatever I'm writing to DBL airlines is a data frame containing airlines. So this is what I'm going to write to the DBL airlines. So I can either save it as an object or just have it like that into this argument value. So if I do that, 
it will be written like it will be my if i do that and come back to my test db you'll see now it has some uh, it was zero zero bytes now it's eight kilobytes and if i try to interrogate the number of tables it will tell me it has a table called tb airline which i just did right now so meaning then i can go ahead and say db list fields just see clearly did you write what i wanted you to write so then provide the connection which is this one and specify the particular table tbl airlines uh, tbl airlines sorry so then it's carrier name carrier and name so you can go ahead and do another table so i can just copy that paste it here and just look for another table that i can i can write uh, then maybe i want to write weather for instance so i can go ahead provide the connection, give it the name, so TBL weather, and go ahead and give it the value. So what do you want to write to the table weather? I want to write this data frame. So value is any data that you are working with or any data that you wish to uh, like uh, drop into this database. Then you go ahead and run. Then if I, if I query the table, there are now two. And if I try to query now the variables on the TBL weather to just ascertain that everything went as expected, uh, I should be able to see the various fields. And that's it. So how you will use this database depends on your, on your, on your needs. But I just want to put out there that uh, you can have a portable uh, relational database management system in the name of SQLite, where you can store your small data or you can store your, you can array, okay, you can organize your data for a project, for instance. And I would want to hear any, if there's any, any comments, any, any discussion that we can have around this uh, SQLite database. Are we cool? Okay. So if we are fine up to that end, I'll close this. And I will remind you that uh, we have exercises here. Those exercises that we've just gone through, they're all here. Database information is here. The database name, the user, and the password, and the solutions uh, to this exercise are also here. So what I want to talk about as we close, uh, we come to an end of this workshop, is the automation of data extraction and processing. And that is a topic of the homework uh, that I had written. I thought maybe I would not have time to, to cover this. But I'm not going to cover it into, into detail. I'm just going to just tell you the possibility, at least show you a few a few implementation, then I think from there, obviously, uh, honestly, it would be, it would be quite uh, straightforward to implement if that's what you're doing in your end. So automation is really something uh, I think many people are interested in uh, uh, when it comes to processing data. So like you've seen, we are able to connect to SQLite, okay, my SQL, SQL Server, Red cup. Uh, assume you have endless possibility to where you can connect to where your data is being stored. So maybe you're not using my SQL, you're not using Red cup. Maybe you're using Cobo Collect, you're using ODK, you're using some 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 data set, data, data, data uh, database which you can connect R2, which it's possible because if the API does not exist, you can always create yours. There are always resources to do that. So assuming you are able to have that magic connection between your R Studio and where your data is stored, the best, the next thing that comes to your mind, how can I automate whatever I'm doing? Maybe you are cleaning data, maybe you are analyzing data, maybe you're doing some visualization. Let's start small. Let's talk about just processing. So you are getting the raw data, you are you are you are running some commands to clean it, and maybe generate some queries and the errors or something like that. The 
the other way, typical way to do it is to have a script, a long script. Let me let me call it a, a cleaning script or something. Uh, uh -huh. So I'll say, um, let me just create a folder here. Maybe I call it data cleaning. It's just uh, data cleaning. So you'll have, for example, a very big script that does the cleaning uh, for you and the processing dot R or an R markdown. That's, that doesn't have to be a script. Maybe it's an R markdown whereby you need, you need to run top down. So, and sometimes it needs your like intervention, like you need to go extract data. For example, if you are not connecting your data, if you're not connecting your R Studio to your database, it needs it then means you have to write things like read.csv, read dot whatever, because you go download manually, bring it in your folders, then read it. So that's the manual part. So suppose your data storage is you are able to connect. For instance, I'm for instance, I'm working with Red Cup per se. So I'm able to connect my Red Cup to my to my R. So I need to maybe, for example, automate whatever I gave you here in the exercise. So if you go into the exercise, you you look at uh, what I did with the, the exercise three solution. Sorry, which is basically going into Red Cup, creating a connection. Okay, uh, pulling the data bit by bit uh, and the combining to a, a full clinical data for use, which is very clean. And I mean, how you like, you expect a clean data to start with. So suppose I don't want to do this thing manually. Ideally, the other way you'll have done this is to go to RedCup, log in, look for baseline, extract it. So let me just show you to appreciate uh, this implementation. The other way I could have gotten this data from RedCup, this baseline data. I will have gone to RedCup, go to data export, then select what I want to export. So I can make a custom or select everything. So when I make a custom, I'll say I only want demographic information from baseline. Then you say export. Then you can choose. You want a CSV, RAW, SPSS, SAS, R, and what have you. Maybe I'll choose that. Then, I mean, the cycle continues. So. And if it's, a, it's, if it's big data, time is lost there because uh, you'll have to wait until this, this, this is done. So then you, you download here. But you see, it's very efficient to have it this way. Connect to R, then pull. Okay. So automation, how does it happen? So there are tools within, at least in the Linux system. I don't know about uh, 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 the, the Windows. So Linux system, that is the R Studio Cloud, and we are using R Studio Server, there is the package cron job. So you can create cron jobs to schedule a script. So when you schedule this script, you give it time interval. You say maybe this, I want this script to be running daily or after every 30 minutes or after every 10 minutes, depending on the, the amount of time your script takes to run. So remember, you have a data cleaning script, which is long, containing a few things uh, to do. So what you need to do is to come to under tools uh, on add-ins, you browse. So I don't know whether you'll find you'll see it on your end, but if it does, if it's not there, you can always install it. So we have the package called Cron, Cron R. So Cron R is the is the is the package that enables you to schedule tasks, or rather you schedule R scripts to run. So for instance, if I had a script that is extracting and the processing data, uh, and that as is being connected to a database, I can schedule it to run after a few, a couple of times. I mean, maybe, maybe twice a day, or maybe it's something I'm doing regularly. I can schedule to do like a few after every few minutes, and that kind of implementation can use you can use it to even feed your shiny so that now, whatever you are using in your whatever data you're using in our chain is real time because it's coming after every every other every other uh, few minutes. So let's get into it. So you go um, to Tron, just highlight, then execute. So it will open this interface. So this interface, uh, okay, uh, 
this interface gives you the parameters parameters to set your 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 basically your 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 scheduler. So launch date, launch hour. So what? How how will you want your data to run? How will you want your 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 how often? Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, or you can choose this as is option and specify your own user interval. So maybe if once does not work for you, and if every minute is too often, if every every hour is too long. You can specify in between. You say like I want after every five years, and you can these materials to be able to know how to get that. I can't remember clearly, but something to do with the star star or something, and uh, forward slash. I don't know. I need to check, but you can obviously specify uh, 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 the, 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 the 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 interval. So then you go ahead and uh, choose what you want to schedule. So go select file. Then say, okay, I want to schedule the R data cleaning script. Then selected. Then you go ahead and maybe you can give it a tag. Maybe describe. Say this is a red cup, and you can have you can have multiple cron jobs running at the same time. So it doesn't have to be one. So you can schedule a lot of a lot of them. So then you can say this is a red cup extraction like that. Then you can give it a tag or not additional argument if they are they are they are. They are uh, uh, like uh, uh, applicable. Then you can decide where you want to save it. So, for instance, so the log. So, where do you want? Because this script produces logs. So, whenever an error occurs occurs in your scheduler, it will it will post an, a log. And uh, where do you want that log to be stored? So, you can either leave it on the home home folder, or you can store it somewhere else. So, once you are you are satisfied with everything. That you've set, uh, you can go ahead and say create job. Uh, did I see an error? Okay, so what's that? Uh, so let me let me repeat that again. So tools, add-ins, browse. I don't know what I did wrong, but exactly. So you get the idea. So what will happen now is that. Uh, let me just do that and try to repeat it uh, like that. And uh, I just do once, then uh, create, is it done? Then create, okay, something like that. So now uh, after one minute, this script will run and whatever is contained here will be executed as well. So think of it, uh, Think of it as uh, a process that you ought to have done top down each every day or after every other few minutes. So you can have all those written there. But I don't want to go deep into that. I just want whoever is interested to try and see if they can give the homework a go to basically uh, implement the automation of extracting data from Red Cup, this one and combining them and having a clean final data set and exporting it. So, because in the script as well, you can have a final product. You can say, okay, after all it's done, write.csv. So give me my clean data. So then it's somewhere in the folder, you come and check after maybe a few days, oh, it's here for today, it's here for tomorrow, like that. So I think that's as far as I can mention. And, uh, if you feel like uh, you will need more insight on this, I'm always available, I'm reachable. You can let me know how I can uh, share with you what I have done with the current jobs before. Um, Christopher, um, David Powell put on the chat that there appears to be a Windows equivalent for task, task scheduler R. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, so I'm just wondering what the differences are. So uh, never use this, but if it works how if it works the same way as um, uh, 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 as this one for Unix, then it simply means you can do the same thing you can do on Unix on your desktop, like you are uh, you are a desktop. So meaning you can have scripts 
uh, that are are being like they, they they live in your computer that needs to be ex executed each and every other time. So, or you have some task that uh, uh, you have to perform at an interval and you don't want to do it manually. Then you can write something. So I don't know. I'll I'll test. I'll just click the link. I'll look at it. I'll test it. And I'll be very happy uh, if it works the same way as the one for Unix, because I've always been looking forward to a similar, a similar implementation on, on Windows. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 David. Thank you so much. OK, so Shandan, I think uh, I would love to stop there. I think I'm a little bit uh, talk too much. <laughs> And I'm sure people are tired as well. So <laughs> no, thank you, thank you very much, um, Christopher. Yeah. Can you just let people know when this is likely to come on YouTube? Yeah, I will. Is that something that's probably in a few days' time or a week's time? Or so what I've seen before is uh, is a couple of hours. I'll talk to I'll open I'll last with Charlotte and. Uh, let, let 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 the information be available. But what I've seen with the other workshops that I have attended, they have availed the video like in uh, in, a, in a couple of hours. Same yeah, day. that's great. Okay, so a quick question from from Liam uh, Quinn: Is there a danger of SQL injection attacks? Sorry, that's interesting. Sorry, I'm just. I don't know what uh, that means. <laughs> Uh, so is there a danger of SQL injection attacks uh, with this? So uh, you, I had that term before. I will need uh, uh, maybe uh, an, exp an, exp an, exp uh, an explanation of what it means. I've heard about SQL injection attacks. What does, what does that mean, Liam? Just go ahead. I think now it's a free, it's a free forum. We just talk no more. <laughs> Can you hear me first of all? Because I'm not sure if this is working for Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Yeah, okay. Um, basically, it's 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 a if you had any forms or anything like that, SQL could be put in places where it shouldn't be. So, for instance, if you had boxes down to your name on certain things, you could actually put SQL code and you could do various injections. That's a very basic example. But in, I'm just thinking with the actual R the in, in the integration with um. The various SQL databases. I mean, I specifically use uh, Microsoft SQL here, mm -hmm. but um, I'm just thinking: uh, has, has there been any known cases with R has has been susceptible to any sort of injection attacks? And none, none that I know. Uh, sorry, that's good. That's that's yeah. good, helpful. Then it's just um, uh, yeah, obviously it was really interesting. Obviously with the um, the the passwords and just securing your credentials. Because yep. obviously I know as well, because I do quite a lot of the security stuff as well in my, in my own spare time. So I know, like, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of a thing called Hashcat, but if yeah. you can get the hash things, I, well, I can, I do my own testing, I can crack my own network in like 10 minutes, it's quite easy. So um, obviously if you get a hold of the SQL hash files, then you can get in via that way. So it's important to secure them. Yep. That was all really, it was just whether, whether we heard of it, that was. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liam. So... And so yes, anybody else is open questions, so please um, ask Chris your questions now while well, we've got a bit of time. Yeah, so if I think we're not getting anything, so yeah. uh, we can wrap up, I think. Okay, so thank you uh, for listening, and I'll pass it to Chandan to close it on. Okay, th thank you ever so much, um, Christopher, for delivering this session. It's been really, really useful. I know most of us have SQL databases at work where we need to draw down data from. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to the session. And uh, Chris, just let us know when it's on YouTube, but I'm sure we'll be watching it in earnest. <laughs> thank you all. I'm going to close the meeting now. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.